meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone, welcome today. Um, we will be recording this session for you um, so that you can watch it on demand um, and we will be able to have that link up for you. Please keep in mind all questions can be answered at the town hall and we would like to introduce you to Greg Glockville. And I apologize that I'm in the middle of coughing right as you're doing the introduction. So Hello, everyone, and welcome. And when I say everyone, my God, this is fabulous. I see we've got <coughs> almost 170 participants today. I'm Greg Lotko, SVP and General Manager for Broadcom Mainframe Software. Thank you so much for joining us today, especially those of you that are just starting your day for another installation of Making Our Strong Community Stronger. Each of these webinars that we've done has been focused on a different area of diversity. And today we're looking at diversity that you cannot see. I'm pleased to introduce to you Cynthia Coupe, a 20 year language pathologist and CEO for outreach, advocacy, resources and services. She wears many hats. I know we all do, but my God, her list is long. She is a parent. She's unfortunately a widow, a speech language pathologist, a TEDx speaker, a blogger, a neurodivergent community member herself, as well as having that in her family, a world traveler and a business owner. She is alongside with an incredible group of panelists from our, our industry and our space to share their stories with us today. Um, before we get started, you should know there's a Q&A space there and the comments down below. Those will be monitored by staff to pass them on to Cynthia and the panelists. And also, please don't forget to tune in for the town hall same time tomorrow to continue the discussion. With that, I'm delighted to introduce and hand this over to Cynthia. Cynthia, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, Greg. And thank you very much for hosting this project. I think it is so incredibly important. And we've had a really fun time getting to know each other and coming up with um, what we want to speak about today. So really, we could talk on this topic for hours, maybe even days or weeks. <laughs> but we have an hour. So we're going to really be barely scratching the surface. Um, but the goal in this is to start a conversation, to create some empathy, to build some bridges, to talk about that proverbial elephant in the room, if you will. So um, even though I'm the moderator, I'm also part of the panel. So sometimes I will be answering the own questions that I ask as well. Um, like Greg said, I have a daughter who is 12 years old. She has autism, ADHD, dyslexia. Um, during her discovery diagnosis process, I realized that I am also on the spectrum. Although I don't have a formal um, diagnosis or label, I definitely, my brain definitely works in that way. So I'm gonna go over some terms that we'll probably talk about, which you may or may not be familiar with, and then I'll have everybody introduce themselves and then we'll get started on, on um, our, our talk today. So the main term that you're gonna be hearing a lot um, is neurodiversity, neurodivergency. Neurodiversity really explains the difference in everybody's brains, kind of like fingerprints, right? So no two are the same. Neurodivergency is that difference that can be categorized um, with a label, if you will, a diagnosis, a discovery. Generally, it is, it's not a formal term. There's no formal definition, but it categorizes differences such as autism, ADHD, anxiety, dyslexia, and more. But that's the general pool that we have when we're talking about neurodivergency. Um, 
Some other terms that we're going to talk about today, neurotypical, that's somebody who is not neurodivergent. Uh, medical model versus social model might come up. Medical model is the very traditional one where you're diagnosed, you have what's wrong with you, that is addressed to help get you back to what would be considered normal or typically functioning. Um, that's not one that we as neurodivergent people subscribe to. We prefer to have the social model, which is let's make this accessible for everybody. Um, then another term that you might hear, or you probably won't hear it in our group so much, but in the world, you might have heard autism or even ADHD described as low functioning versus high functioning. Um, that's not a formal uh, way to explain it, but it had come from talking about people's IQ, unfortunately. However, you could have somebody who is autistic and does not talk and has a very high IQ, but they could have been described as low functioning because they don't talk. Um, or some people might say, oh, they have autism, but they're high functioning, meaning that they can talk, they can hold a job, you might not notice that they have autism, but really that's just a way of othering ourselves from other people who are neurodivergent and we prefer to <laughs> not other ourselves. Um, spiking intelligence or split skills, we'll talk about that later. That's something that will come up and we'll describe that. That's just the difference between maybe you're really good at one thing and not so good at another. Um, masking, that is very common in autism where uh, we learn what the typical rules are that we're supposed to follow and so we do them and you might not notice that we are autistic or functioning in a different way because we've learned how to not show our true selves. Uh, it can be both a benefit and a curse really. Um, ableist, that's being in favor of able-bodied people. So a lot of um, terms that are out there or uh, ways that have Functioned in society might be ableist ways, and uh, that'll come up a little bit. I just kind of want to brush through these. And then universal design for living or even universal design for the workplace. That's making everything accessible to everybody at any time. Um, a really easy example I think of when I think of that is having wheelchair ramps. Like everybody can walk up the wheelchair ramp, but people that are in a wheelchair can also use it. So, um, and then again, like I was saying, diagnosis versus discovery. We all have different terms that we like to refer to ourselves with. I like to use whatever um, the person who has the difference is, right? So for example, um, Ken prefers to use the term discovery versus diagnosis for, his, for him. And my daughter has also a tick disorder. She doesn't like that term. I don't blame her. So she calls it her patterns. So um, mm -hmm. just going with what what people say. So we might come up with some things that, you know, aren't like a typical thing, but, but they are for us. Okay. So that said, I would like to have Ben go ahead and introduce himself first. Yes. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Hello everyone. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Ben Van Hook. I'm an autistic graduate student at George Mason University studying public policy with an emphasis in education policy, having graduated from Mercer's University in 2021. I'm currently working as a program and outreach associate at the organization for Autism Research, which is an organization dedicated to funding applied research studies supporting the autistic community. I enjoy public speaking and autism advocacy, having spoken at many international and domestic conferences surrounding autism and employment, autism and education, and I push for moving to a world beyond mere acceptance and into a world of appreciation of autism and bridging the gap between neurodivergency and neurotypicality. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. Ken, why don't you introduce yourself next? Thank you, Greg and Cynthia for your introduction and Ben as well. I am Kenneth Ellington. I'm a software engineer that's been in IT for 33 years now. It was 30 years in, 23 months ago, when I learned that I am autistic. And like Cynthia talked about, I bounce around between the terms to use because I'm still learning those myself. Um, my role today in Broadcom is more of an infrastructure support role, uh, what we used to call systems administrator, as opposed to actual software engineering. And that's been something I've enjoyed doing is going back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chelsea. 
Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you everyone for being here today and making time for this important conversation. My name is Chelsea Asaro. I'm a solutions director with Rangam Sourceable. Rangam is a minority woman disability owned global solution, workforce solutions company. Sourceable is our specialty program that helps large scale companies recruit, hire and retain more talent with disabilities, autism and neurodivergence. Um, that's, that's a mouthful, that's a little bit of corporate speak. So I like to say that I help great companies hire great people and great jobs and keep them. Um, I've been working in the neurodiversity employment space for about nine years, so about as long as it's been a thing, and have helped several large scale technology companies like Qualcomm and Solar Turbines launch several um, uh, very successful autism at work hiring programs. I also identify as neurodivergent myself as a trauma survivor, and I have a very close family connection with an autism spectrum condition. Um, and Cynthia, can I add one thing? I, I'm a bit of a word geek. So do you mind if I just take a minute to, <laughs> to comment? And it's such, <laughs> such an interesting time right now because in this space, our language is almost evolving faster than we can keep pace with it. So there's a lot of grace in this space for the words we use, but I do think to Cynthia's point, understanding the words people prefer um, when having conversations about neurodiversity is, is really important. Uh, but also you wanna make sure that, that you're kind of up to speed so that you can have the conversations we need to have. So my, I'm just gonna share one little nuance. It's a little bit of, pet, of a pet peeve of mine, which <laughs> is when talking about neurodiversity first, it's not an, an us versus them conversation. Neurodiversity includes all of us, right? Yes. Those with neurodivergence and neurotypical people are those without. Mm -hmm. um, but also neurodiverse does not refer to an individual. It refers to the group that has both people with cognitive differences as well as those without. And right now, by the way, there's over 600 conditions that fall under the neurodiversity and neurodivergence umbrella. Um, so just a little nuance there. Neurodiverse is a group. Neurodivergent or neurodistinct, which is a new term, <laughs> more of, is the individual. So Wonderful. thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> No, definitely. I mean, and that's the that's the thing, right? We have the, the space to to be open and, and talk about it. And like you said, it's evolving as we speak, really. Yeah. Um, a couple other things that I just wanted to say real quick is that as part of my job, uh, we talked about this with the panel earlier, is if somebody gets off track or forgets a question or feels, you know, like uh, they need a minute, that's fine. That's not a problem at all. We're all, you know, a little nervous, kind of not making it up as we go along, but a little bit. Also, you might see us fidgeting. I know I have something to fidget with because that helps me focus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So if I'm wiggling around, you know, it's not because I had too much caffeine. <laughs> it's just because that's part of what actually helps me focus. So <laughs> I just want to bring that out so that I can feel free to be me. <laughs> All right. So um, the first question, I'm sorry, actually, let me back up just one second. I did want to also just speak briefly to the estimated number of people who are neurodivergent in the world, which is 40% is the estimated guesstimate. I, I personally think it's higher than that. Um, the formal diagnoses that we have is largely based on children that are diagnosed before the age of five or eight. Most of those are white males. There's some uh, ways that the diagnosis currently happens that is very um, structured so that it's the white males that are more easily diagnosed. So women are not so much girls, females, and same with people of color or other races. So um, I just wanna mention that because a lot of times you might think of autism and think, you know, white men, um, but that's really not true. So there's a lot of under identification in other categories. All right, so first I'm gonna start with you, Ken. Um, and this question is for all of you, but Ken, you'll be answering first. I'd love, your stories between you and Ben are very different um, growing up. You're clearly different ages, which means that there, you know society has changed a lot in that time. So I would like for you to speak a little bit about what kind of supports you've had in your life in relationship to your neurodivergency and then how has that been for you to have those supports? Thank you. Um, it was around the middle school years when I knew something was, back then I thought wrong, but I knew something was off because I wasn't able to build friendships the way I saw all my classmates doing. I grew up in an incredible family full of depression survivors, um, World War II veterans, and a lot of those people became master trades. And so I've got an incredible work ethic of 
get the job done no matter what it is. And uh, so a very common phrase I heard was just be yourself. Well, the more I was myself, the more my autistic traits came out that we didn't know anything about. Uh, you fast forward to the workplace, and there's been a handful of people that stepped in on their own to be allies and buddies in some way. There are certainly some situations I was in where I probably came very close to getting fired, were it not for some of those people, because of things I said. And maybe the thing I said was okay, but the way it came out, you know, questioned integrity or authority or, or some other aspect of that person's, you know, position. Um, the most interesting and enjoyable one was Kate in a recent environment. She learned in the first week or two that something was off and I was in the middle of it and I couldn't see it. We came out of a meeting one day. She hooked her arm through mine, took me to a room, shut the door, stuck her finger in my face and said, you need help. Hmm. And, and out of that became a, a, the, the most beautiful mentoring relationship I've ever had. Uh, she would always sit next to me in meetings. And when she saw my anxiety spinning up or, you know, something, I was fidgeting, she'd kick me under the table and, and get me to change my focus. So I've had wonderful people like that that have offered support. But then you fast forward to today. I didn't know if I was coming back to an IT job or not after learning about being autistic. There, there was a profound period of grief to go through. In fact, it, you know, I told my wife, I'm leaving on this two-week road trip. I'm not sure what's happening after that job-wise. Two weeks after I came back is when Broadcom launched diversity at Broadcom. And so I reached out to HR, and here we are today. So thank you. That's, I mean, that story you've told, I've heard it a few times now, and each time it just gives me goosebumps, you know, to, to know that, like, it worked out for you. Mm -hmm. you are. Thank you. Yeah. Ben, how about for you? Yeah, thank you for the question. So as Chelsea mentioned, issues of neurodiversity is not an us versus them thing. It includes all of us, and we must work together collaboratively to bridge a gap between neurodivergency and neurotypicality. But unfortunately, in my elementary school to high school years, this was not the case. We were, as neurodiverse individuals, neurodivergent individuals seen as different from neurotypicals. We were put into special education classrooms in elementary school, which um, was separate from the general education classroom. And this was meant to give me more focused, personalized attention. However, looking back on it, I would have preferred to stay in the general education classroom with my neurotypical peers because being apart from my peers made it very difficult for me to make friends. I was often, I was often seen as weird. I was put in people's out groups because they never had an opportunity to get to know me and familiarize my, themselves with me because we were in different classes all the time. In middle school and high school, I went to private schools which were specifically designed for neurodiverse individuals. The professors there were supportive of my, of my needs, but I never had the opportunity to interact with neurotypical students because these were neurodiverse only school settings. So I was ill prepared to work alongside neurotypicals in the classroom setting in college. In college, I was a part of an autism program which really helped me make friends and I was given more accommodations. I used extended time on tests, which helped me with scantrons because it can be really time consuming just translating my A, B, C, D, D answers onto a separate piece of paper. Sometimes it can take even longer to fill out the scantron than complete the actual exam. I also had housing accommodations. So instead of living in a dorm, I lived in a suite where I had my own bedroom, a shared bathroom, shared living room, and I shared a kitchen with a roommate. And that helped because I needed my personal space. I also had note takers, which kind of helped me because sometimes teachers can move way too fast when moving through content. So it helps to have something to refer back to. But one of the most important accommodations and supports I had was like having first choice at classes. And this was because I knew myself, I knew when I operated best, whether it was like morning or mid afternoon. So choosing classes around those times without a fear that like they'd be taken really helped my anxiety. So mm -hmm. I think having all those supports in college I didn't have in middle school and high school, including interacting with neurotypical individuals really helped my development where I am today. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I wanna hear yours too, Chelsea, and then I have something to say about it as well. So go ahead. 
Yeah, I, you know, I think that it's a really, I think both Ken and Ben are speaking to kind of a shift that we're seeing happening. They both experienced early on in their lives, this medical model approach, which is that we're broken and need to be fixed and need to operate within uh, certain social norms. And a lot of the, the therapies and the, the supports that were received when they were younger was about how to fit everyone's expectations. What's exciting now, what's exciting to me about the neurodiversity concept, which I think has really become a movement. Um, you know, it started out as just an alternative way of thinking about autism, but now it's really become this, this really grassroots movement of nothing about us without us. We're, we're not a disease to be cured or a disorder to be fixed, just a naturally occurring cognitive variations that should be included, like different races and genders are included. What I love about what I get to do is I get to talk with companies about, okay, how do, how do we operationalize that? How do we make that happen? You know, how do we allow people to be who they are, be their authentic selves so they can bring that, that unique perspective, that unique lived experience, the innovation, all those things we're looking for on their teams, how do we create spaces where they can do that? You know, I have one team member that I work with who self-identifies as being autistic, who sits in meetings and spins in chairs and no one kicks him under the table, Ken. That's what he needs to do. And yeah. we're okay letting him do that. And, you know, another great example, it's really just looking again, we talked about universal workplace design. It's giving each person what they need. And we don't want siloed processes. We don't want to create something just for people with autism or other forms of neurodivergence. You know, if someone with autism says, hey, I really need a quiet place to take a break, that should be made available to everyone and everyone can benefit from that. Um, you know, a great example I gave in our run through was imagine you're a hiring manager working on a team and you're working on a project and you have a team member who comes to you and says, hey, I am maxed out. I need a break. I'm going to go get a coffee. Of course, you're going to say, yeah, sure, go ahead, get me a vanilla latte. But what if they came to you and said, hey, I'm really maxed out. I need a break. I'm going to turn all the lights off in my office. I'm going to put on noise canceling headphones and I might go under my desk just to take a little 10 minute uh, sensory break. You need, <clears throat> we need to be as open to those answers as we are to, you know, to I need a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. So, but what's great is the dialogue is changing and I'm seeing that happen. And it's a super exciting time to be neurodivergent and to be in the workplace. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. So um, <clears throat> what I wanted to speak to a little bit on that was, you know, I also grew up like Ken did not, not being identified, um, <clears throat> but I was pulled out to go to social communication groups when I was in third grade because I didn't know how to make friends. And, you know, we moved around a little bit, um, but it was always very difficult for me to make friends. And the place we finally landed, the friends that I made were also neurodivergent, it turns out, like we're still friends. <laughs> None of us are, you know, formally identified, but all of us have kids that are formally identified, actually. Um, but also, you know, as as Greg said in the introduction, my formal training is as a speech language pathologist. So I got my degree 20 years ago and very much was, you know, specifically taught the medical model, right? So here's here's the person, here's their problem, get them to stop doing that, get them to be this way. And, you know, it never sat right with me. It was just like, I, you know, I want to take this person and like help them be the best version of themselves that they can be, that they want to be, or if they can't tell me that, that their family would like to be. And so um, I feel like that's actually starting to really change also in the, in the medical world, which is very, very exciting. Ben, you had something to say. Yeah, no, there's support box can be really important and it's something Chelsea brought up in our run through is having an ally, whether it's yes. in the workplace or whether it's in school, having a peer mentor to kind of guide us through mm -hmm. um, the challenges of everyday life, helping us understand social norms and the social environment and having an ally can really make a difference in autistic individuals' lives and other neurodiverse individuals. Yeah. Lives as well, it can provide a sense of companionship people can have like a trusted trusting relationship with these individuals and I think it can just really help us in the long term absolutely Ken that's something that uh, Broadcom did through the mainframe division that I'm in not long after the diversity initiative kicked off they brought in lean in which is the organization created by Sheryl Sandberg which has expanded to include initiatives beyond gender with women. Mm -hmm. So they asked me if I'd lead one of those groups and I said, maybe. And a few more weeks went by. So there I was creating one of those groups. And then today there's six allies in it that are neurotypical. 
a couple of people have come to me privately that are in the company and say, hey, can I ask you questions? Because they're starting to think maybe they are. Mm -hmm. And so a, a person did come forward recently and said, hey, I just learned this about myself. Is the company serious about this? I said, yeah, because here's what's about to happen, this webinar today. And here's what we've already been doing. So that support is crucial for, for people to have an eager willingness to learn about us and meet us in the middle somewhere. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's one of those big spillover benefits that we see from companies when they start launching initiatives, whether it's a hiring initiative or whether it's ERGs who are forming just affinity groups around neurodiversity. All of a sudden, you're creating that space, that safe space where people feel appreciated and supported. And every time I come into a company to launch a program, we're talking about how to create more opportunities for people who have been historically shut out of the workplace because right. of the neurodivergence. But once we get in, all of a sudden, people start putting their hands up and saying, me too. And I could benefit, like you said, from those supports. I could use the peer and the mentor. You know, I could use an, an ally or, or a neurodiversity employment specialist to help me um, explain to my hiring manager what I need to be successful. You know, it just, it's really, I mean, I get very passionate about it because it's so exciting to see the conversations that happen when we start to have panels like this. And Absolutely. Create this. Yeah. Yeah. And, Oh, it's also, um, I think it'd be interesting to see the effects of having advisory panels in yes. different organizations around neurodiversity. So neurodiverse individuals and allies can come together and discuss issues surrounding neurodiversity, whether it's in the hiring process, whether it's someone actually at the organization. So we can not only increase um, the amount of hires, but we can also increase job retention and work satisfaction within the organization for neurodivergent individuals. And Discussing these issues can also um, allow individuals who might not feel comfortable talking about neurodiversity to have a safe space to kind of discuss different issues so it can open up that conversation yeah. and it can lead to systematic change within organizations. Absolutely. I was telling you, having that, that those neurodiversity panels that weigh in on processes like hiring process and interviews, we were talking before the, the panel mm -hmm. on interviews and what works for those who are neurodivergent versus people who are neuro neurotypical and asking direct questions related to experience, not open ended questions, but all of the things this is universal design you know, in action. All of these things is only going to make the experience of interviewing and onboarding better for all the employees. It's essential for neurodivergent employees, right. but it's going to really improve the yeah. experience for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. That was um, one of the things kind of that I touched on in the beginning is that this, this could really go on for days or weeks or months <laughs> because there's so many different parts of it and really it should, right? Like as, as part of like having that be the culture of your workplace or something like this, exists or even the culture of your friendship group it doesn't really matter like you know just starting these conversations and having them is so you know so critical and so important um the next question that i'm going to ask is actually a little bit different than than i than i had it's similar to what i had done in our practice practice round um just a little tweak on that so I had been talking about knowing ourselves and understanding ourselves and that that's really where so much of our power lies in being able to say, hey, I have this preference or, you know, I have this need um, and that, you know, that's that's a lifelong discovery for sure. Um, and I had been asking, you know, how have you learned about yourself, but I think really I want to kind of uh change it a little bit and say what is something that you would like the general population to know about you specifically or hidden diversity in general and then kind of couching on that what's something that you know we, we sort of talked about this with allies but um has helped you in your friendships or your work relations with the neurotypical population and i'll have you go first on this then yeah, thank you. Um, so something, the first question was like something that you've learned that can, can yeah. help. Can. So I think one of the things that has helped me was that I was born in a neurotypical household. So I was, I was kind of raised neurotypical. I was given a lot more freedom than many autistic individuals um, I know have. So I think having that freedom, being able to explore and try new things really benefited me because I learned what um, to work, what works. I also learned um, 
what I can do to remedy mistakes because I was allowed to make mistakes. And it really taught me how to problem solve, how to critically think, how to remedy mistakes once they've been made. And I think having to learn from my mistakes really helped me. So I think something that um, parents, educators, and employers can do is to like unleash autistic individuals and to let them explore the environment so long as they're not hurting themselves or other people and um, allow them to make mistakes and allow them to learn from their mistakes because that's one of the best ways in which we can um, learn who we are and learn what strengths we have and what we might need to improve upon. Yeah, yeah. That, that freedom of learning ourselves is so critical, right? Like, I think we had talked at one point about helicopter parents, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like that example. Um, Ken, how about you? My short-term memory shifted left a bit. Can you repeat That's the fine. question, please? Sure, absolutely. So what's something that you would like the general population to know about you or the way that you learn or hidden diversity in general? The two best ways that I, thank you for repeating. Of course. Two crucial things about me is, is being a prolific reader uh, as evidenced by the bookshelf behind me. That's the last three years of books <laughs> and there's more on the other side. Um, so the prolific reading and that environment I grew up in with all those master trades that were carpenters and stonemasons, learning a process, adapting it sometimes when you need to, but sticking to the process to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And back to some of the comments made about allies, um, one of the things that came up one time was someone in a leadership chain wanted to terminate me because they looked at what I did and I only put two things in production in a year and my six peers put two or three releases of software. But then that buddy showed up one day in a meeting because he was involved in it and said, hey, let me show you the call log for support after hours. Now, I'm not saying my code was perfect. We found issues, but they didn't rise to the occasion of having a customer not be able to buy the product or service. And so it's that dedication and drive to something that's a quality job. And something that came out in the workplace recently that our an understanding in me is a little bit of an Easter egg and it's that license plate above me. Uh, that's a nickname from ages ago. A part of what people have experienced with me in the workplace is me trying to be an extrovert, but not knowing I was an extrovert because I thought I was an introvert for 53 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that lifetime that I was in, you know, that phase in life where that license plate came from was me and a group being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just didn't know how to communicate to people. Right. Right. And what a freeing experience, right? Like, like it must feel so, um, so good to to be able to realize who you are and have that match up, right? It's it's like finding your finding your people. Yeah. Chelsea. So Ken, do I get to call you Tippy from now on? <laughs> if you'd like, yes. <laughs> thank you I'll for plead, sharing I'll that plead, with us. Thank you. I'll plead the fifth if anybody asks any questions about <laughs> it. So. <laughs> so that that's a big question. And I I have much. Much, much thoughts. Let me see if I can encapsulate them. Um, first of all, you asked about what we, what I would like people to know about me, and what I usually start off when, when presenting. And it is part of my job to do. I am on our corporate training team, but what my trauma looks like for me in the workplace, where it surfaces mostly, is that I have an, an overreactive fight or flight um, response whenever I feel unsafe. So how does that show up? Uh, well, when was the last time you felt safe in presenting in a panel like this? So <laughs> I'm actually doing pretty good today, but I usually start off with that so that people know because a lot of times my pace is very accelerated. Mm -hmm. I usually tell people, but it'll be okay. It should calm down in about a half hour or so. So we'll all get through it together. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I like people to know about me. As far as what would I want, um, other people to know about neurodiversity and neurodivergence. Um, ben, I loved what you shared for the parents out there and for the, for the teachers. And, and as an autism mom myself, 
that's the one thing I wish I had known when I started my journey as a parent was if you think about our goal for all our children is for them to live their best lives, their most independent lives in whatever way they envision that. And the only way they can do that is if we give them space to, like you said, to try things, to fail and to learn how to communicate with other people. A lot of times I feel like I stepped in for my child to help communicate instead of allowing him to learn how to, to advocate for himself. Um, and so letting them have those opportunities to develop relationships with other people, to learn how to communicate their needs, to try new things and find out what interests them is so important. You know, a lot of times we do include natural support providers like parents and job coaches and service providers on all of our calls when we're, when we're interviewing, working with candidates to help find placements. Uh, but sometimes I do have to tell moms out there, you know, I, and, and dads, like, you know, I really need, you know, your child to answer this question, unless you plan on going to work with them, <laughs> you know, um, and then the other thing for everybody, all hiring managers, employers out there, um, I want them to know people with neurodivergence can be really successful in any role at, at any level. There's a lot of misconceptions out there, like people with autism are really good at tech. You know, they're all the Sheldons of the world. And while yes, there are some people out there who have a great natural aptitude and strengths in that area. I've seen people be successful. You know, there's misconceptions about customer service that they can't be front facing. I've seen people be very front facing. People like Ken who are extroverts right. and do great with clients and customers. I've seen people in the trades be very successful. So not limiting people to preconceived notions about where you think they can be successful and also not assuming that we put them in one job and that's where they're going to be, but looking for growth, looking for some people, they may not want to go in management opportunities, but some people really do. And if they don't want to go to management, where else, how else can they grow? Because, you know, we really want everyone to be, have the maximum amount of success and really be able to use those unique skills and experiences yeah. for the benefit of the company. Yeah. Then it looks like you have something to say also. Yeah. Um, as Chelsea said before, I think it's important to, um, you know, to allow children to explore. But I want to point out that um, being like emotionally supportive of your child is not mutually exclusive to helping them develop independence and social skills. I think you can do both at the same time. The way I see it is that parents can, should like serve as a guide for their child so they can let the child explore new environments, try new things, but they can always come to that parent for questions, but they're the ones who are going to have to be the ones to ask questions and um, any way they can. So I think you can do both at once. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And choices, all you parents out there, choices are your friends. You know, yeah. give your child choices, you know, ones that are within reasonable, uh, guidelines and let them choose which yeah. they're going to take. Give them some um, uh, autonomy and self-direction. Right. And I'd say also um, slightly different, like answering the same question, but in a, in a little bit of a different way is that something that I really get from uh, my, well, all my peers really is like more so sometimes the neurotypical ones, but that uh, give me feedback, you know, oh, I noticed you always do this thing or I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Like I noticed that like, you're always uh, turning off the music when, you know, we're having a conversation. It's like, oh, right, I do. Yeah, you're right. Cause I can't focus on what you're saying. So, you know, being able to, to have that feedback is so helpful sometimes because we can't always see ourselves from, from you know, the viewpoint of ourself. Um, so I'm gonna move on to our next question which has to do with communication style actually. And this, this like, I mean, <laughs> Oh, we could have 12 years of research articles about this whole thing, but, uh -huh. <laughs> but to, to put it simply, um, you know, in a lot, obviously I'm a speech language pathologist. So communication styles is my specialty. And, uh, you know, I see this all over the place. I've had this conversation with Ben, Ken and, and Chelsea as well, that one of the things that I see a lot is kind of like, um, a breakdown or a miscommunication between communication styles. Of course, that can happen, you know, neurotypical to neurotypical. It can happen neurodivergent to neurodivergent. But I feel like from neurotypical to neurodivergent, what we see a lot of is we often need things very explicit. Um, and that doesn't feel um, affrontive to us. It doesn't feel threatening a lot of times. It's like just helpful information. But sometimes that can feel um, like an uncomfortable style of communication for somebody who's not used to it. So 
I'm just wondering, um, Ken, what is something valuable that you've learned or that you get from the neurotypical population or how can, how can you speak to this with communication styles for yourself? What have you seen? Well, one of the challenges that I had that was very difficult is my sentence structure and vocabulary was very complex. And that was really brought to light finally with one of the allies in the lean in group. He reached out to me and said, Hey, how about using Grammarly? Give it a try. And so I started that about six or nine months ago. And I shared in our dry run Monday that the previous two weeks before I used 6,000 words that 99% of Grammarly users did not. Well, I got this week's email for last week and it was 6,000 more words. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges I ran into that neurotypical peers didn't know how to help me with is they could see, I, we could see when a communication went south in a meeting or a face-to-face -face discussion, but we could never put a finger on why. Mm -hmm. And so I adopted Grammarly. And then a few months later, we're having one of the lean in monthly meetings and the people that are part of that group are seeing my emails and they said, Hey, there's something that's changing that you may not realize. My speaking style was changing too, the way Grammarly was coaching me through grammar and syntax and everything else to make things simple. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say simple in a bad way, but I would write sentences that spanned five rows mm -hmm. with commas and, and it, it made perfect sense to me, but not the people I was communicating to. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great, great example, honestly. And <clears throat> um, well, I'll let Ben go first and then I'll, I'll come back to, to something. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, similar to Ken, I sometimes use lingo and jargon that like other people might not understand, especially when it comes to psychology, because that was my major in, in school and um, talking about things like cognitive dissonance or talking about operand versus fossil conditioning and a lot of people who aren't um, in the research field might not know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to conversation, I, in the past, I have had some difficulty. I sometimes I'm too honest or blunt. So in the past, when someone asked like, does this dress make me look fat? I would say yes. Um, instead of something like maybe something else might work better. Mm -hmm. um, I think the question around um, communication in the workplace and direct communication in the workplace is also connected to the medical versus social model. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes people, I think we need to distinguish direct communication um, from rude communication. And I think when it comes to direct communication, we operate best as autistic individuals when the communication addresses a problem. So this could be um, maybe you need to edit this word or edit this article on Grammarly or something before submitting it or publishing it. I think what we what isn't okay is if we blame the person and if we're direct um, addressing the personality of that person. So saying you're so incompetent or how could you think this? That doesn't really help us. So my strategy is to focus on the problem, not the person. And I operate best in a blame-free environment where we are direct in addressing the problem at hand, such as saying something like this order is incomplete or incorrect, can you fix it, rather than personally attack the person or imply that the person is to blame for the incident. I think it's important yeah. right in a direct environment that is blame free. Yeah, and uh, Chelsea, before I let you go, I want to speak directly to this. Some, something that I actually coach people on a lot um, is because because the question is always, and I mean, it's a completely legitimate question. Like, is it is it really okay to directly address this thing, or like, how do I say this without being rude? Or, and and so I I coach people on having come from be from you. So if I said, you know, Ken, I'm having a really hard time understanding these sentences of yours because they're long and I just get lost. Like, I'm sure you have something good to say in there, but like, I'm not getting it. Can you put that out in a different way? Or, you know, something so it's not like, wow, Ken, those sentences are just too long. Like, forget it. What's wrong with you? You know, right? So like, I feel like, because because that really is, like I come from, if, if there's a breakdown, we're not getting something. And so it feels, I think, a lot less, personal and um you know in your face for lack of better description to to put it that way because that really is where we're we're coming from with it and i think that we we don't mind i mean you know 
when it when it is in that kind uh, come from to, to have it be direct. But go ahead, Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, so I'm so glad you hit on this on communication styles and 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 Cynthia, I really appreciate that you brought up in the, in your opening remarks about um, you know that different communication styles don't aren't necessarily bad or wrong communication styles and like you said, people who might use assistive communicate communication devices um, are can still contribute as much as someone who is very verbal and allowing space for that and understanding the differences. I think is super important. Um, as far as tips, you know, communication tips, uh, clear direct language. Uh, I really think it's important to provide sometimes things in alternative formats. So yeah. a lot of a lot of times we see people request, you know, seeing things in writing instead of having someone just tell you what to do. Please, you know, put it in writing with clear uh, deadlines and timeframes. I think that that's super helpful as well. On the other side, if you find that your person like myself because of my trauma, like some of my colleagues with ADHD, like some of the people I know, like Ken talked about, who are who have a spectrum condition, who tends to go on a little too much. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some people really effectively use a safe word that you can let other people know that because we've all we're changing social norms here. Yeah. We've all been taught not that interrupting is rude and we don't want to interrupt. And so we have to relearn how to do that. And it feels really uncomfortable at first, mm -hmm. but it, it is really only going to help us communicate better if we give that feedback because everybody right. does want feedback. <laughs> we want to know how we're doing and how we can do better. But at the same time, we have to, to just know we talked about this in our, our dry run that if we are going to have an, you know, a, a diverse workforce, if we're going to have inclusive communities, if we're going to include people that are, do not just have different gender and different races, but also different thought styles and communication styles, guess what? We're going to have some points of creative friction. And I think we should celebrate when those moments happen. I talked about a time when a colleague of mine who does, is very literal and direct because of their autism, and sometimes that does, you know, he's talked about being misperceived as being rude, but it, it could also come off very aggressive. It was hitting my trauma in the wrong way. So we had neurodivergence meeting neurodivergence and we had to be able to come together, put words around that, talk about our experiences and, and be able to find a way that we could both communicate better and kind of meet in the middle. But I, I actually love it when I, you know, we're, we really are changing social norms. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the creative friction because that means we're not caught in groupthink. That yeah. means that we are we are getting the kinds of teams that we want to see, right? Yeah. They're really going to change the world. Yeah, um, I'm going to say one thing about that, and then go on to the next question. That I love your example of a safe word. So I, I have a direct example of that. Something that that I tend to do is um, I can be very rude in the way that I answer questions or that I make requests sometimes, and it's. It, it seems like I'm uh, unhappy or, uh, you know, being a, a B letter <laughs> word, right? Um, and that's really not what's happening at all. It's just like in my head, you know, somebody said something to me and like it didn't match up with whatever I was thinking. And it's like, no, I would never do that or wh whatever it is. So this, this is something that my late husband uh, <laughs> noticed a lot and that my daughter notices a lot. And, you know, my daughter and I are very, very similar. So, uh, you know, thank goodness she gets me and she has patience for me. And so she, she's just like, mama, when you respond to me in that way, it feels like you're being really mean or like you're being rude. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, literally it took her <laughs> you know, a few years ago to point this out to me. And, and she's like, how about if I just, can I, like, I was like, what can we do about that? She's like, can I just give you a word? And I was like, yes, if you, if you give me a word when I'm doing that, that would be really helpful because I don't know. Like, I really don't know. So we've, we've done that and it is helpful. Um, it really does work. So the last question that I want to hit on, I'm actually going to start on this one. Um, it, it hits on that split skills shared, uh, you know, spiking intelligence, which is, you know, where we can be very smart in some ways and um, not so bright in other ways. Uh, you know, sometimes that comes, you know, hey, I'm great at math, but I'm dyslexic. I can't really read. Or I... I'm very good visually, but auditorily, I don't take information in. But it, it can also happen um, just with our understanding within a conversation. And so, uh, this feels so vulnerable. Okay, here I go. So when I was interviewing to be the moderator for this panel, um, I was asked to have a conversation with the people that were, you know, 
potentially hiring me. And I didn't really know what to expect. I wasn't really thinking of it like an interview. So in the conversation, the two people, you know, introduced themselves and talked about, you know, what their history was and then asked me to tell about mine. And I was like, oh God, I wasn't expecting this. So I was really nervous because, you know, one thing about people on the spectrum is we really don't usually sell ourselves very well unless we're prepared to, like, we just don't see, I mean, it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but we, it's just not a skill set of ours that comes naturally to us. So, um, so I was very nervous about that. And then, you know, the conversation went on and, you know, felt like it was going okay, but I was just, my brain was like going a million miles an hour and I was having a hard time taking information in. So at some point they asked me, um, what did I know about, I think they probably asked, what did I know about the mainframe project? But the only word that I really got out of that was mainframe. And I was like, oh my God, that's random. Like, what do I know about a mainframe? Uh, well, like I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm pretty sure the mainframe is the brains of the computer, but like, I'm not an IT person, but like, why would they be asking me this question? You know, and I was just spinning out. And so what I said, was, <laughs> well, my brother works in IT. I'm sure I could ask him, <laughs> you know, and they were like, okay. You know, like, like I was clear that I really didn't answer that question correctly. And I'm thinking like, what did I do wrong? Like, you know, I figured I'm like phone a friend. That's always a good answer. You know? um, and, you know, we kind of went on and, and finished the, the interview and it took me three days to really figure out what had happened um, to figure out that it must have been the main frame frame project, completely reasonable interview question. You know, what do you know about the organization that is like hiring you? Um, and I shared that with my daughter and she's like, oh, mama, you just looked dumb. And I was like, I know, I know I did. <laughs> Here you are. So but here I am. So <laughs> really, I did it's a mainframe right. project. But I, you know, it, but it's just like, it's just one of those things where like that happens sometimes, you know, and it's great when we can laugh at ourselves, but we don't always catch it. Like, it's also great when we can tell somebody later on, hey, I did this thing that, but, you know, we don't always have that chance to backtrack. So I just wanted to kind of share a very human experience that I had, you know, <laughs> and I wanted to see if, um, Ken, did you have one that you wanted to share or Ben, either uh, one of you? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's definitely a spiky profile around my memory. Uh, when it comes to software engineering, especially, I can think of the most esoteric detail. So I'm trying to solve something in Python today and then I start seeing in my memory something I did in C++ in 1998 that was similar. But if you ask me to what we paid on the restaurant check the night before or what you said a minute ago when you did the introduction or the question and I had to ask again the question, that short term memory just is, is not there. But I find it bizarre that that's how my memory works, that I can recall those details from so long ago, but then something right in front of me that just happened. I don't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me two years from now, I'll remember that. It, it's bizarre how it works that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ben, how about you? Um, I actually made a LinkedIn post about this and it kind of relates to how versus life functioning autism and the dangers of using those terms because someone might um, seem very confident in one area, but they may not really be as, um, well versed in another area and for me it's like I can tell you everything you need to know about psychology and to psychology I scored in the 94th percentile on my psych major system exam in college but when it comes to things like pop culture fiction of any sort or fantasy I struggle I'm really bad at naming artists or different movies or learning like the latest trends or lingo and I'm the worst movie watcher ever so people, I'm one of those people who can like ask a billion questions at the cinema and people just are like, be quiet, stop talking. I'm trying to watch a movie. And um, the thing is I can't really hold the question in because people are then when I like ask them afterwards, they're like, what part of the movie were you referring to? And I'm like, I don't know. I was focused on the question. I don't remember the part of the movie, the specific yeah as to like when I was asking it or what part I was referring to. Um, but when it comes to movies, I'm a really fact-oriented person. I'm also really practical and I think about the practical implications of the movie. So I'm, when I was watching Harry Potter with my friends, I 
ask questions like is Hogwarts a publicly funded or privately funded institution? Is free healthcare a thing in Hogwarts because the professors don't seem to care if the students get injured? What's the criminal liability for the school if students get injured? So um, my mind really can't comprehend fiction or anything that strays from reality. Okay, wait, I, can I piggyback off Ben's comments? Please. I have to say that is a good example of exactly why we want to include people with neurodivergence on our teams. Yes. Because Ben's <laughs> example of Hogwarts and how he viewed that and the questions he asks really shows that unique perspective and what people with cognitive differences can bring. They yes. can look at a problem from a completely different angle and can, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people that have this, the great ability with the memory and, and ability to think in pictures and remember things and pictures and remember things from years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to add that when working on, like you said, that Python problem, you know, if we don't have neurodiverse teams, then it's like you're, you know, imagine having a think tank and you're trying to solve your company's biggest problem, but the one person with the answer isn't invited to the meeting. Right. Yeah. You know? So I love that. I love both of your examples. <laughs> and thank you, Cynthia, for your vulnerability and sharing that story. I'm glad it worked out and that you're here. Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, you know, yeah, I, uh, you said something about, uh, you know, thinking in pictures or not, like, absolutely. I think my daughter called me the other day, she had to pack for a trip she was going on with her dad. And um, she's like asking me where all these things were. And I was just like, I just closed my eyes and I could, I can picture where each one of them are, right? I can show her where each one of them are. But like, if there's really anything that I have to listen to, like, forget it, like, I'll, you know, be like, and then the most important answer for the million dollars, I'm like, oh, hey, what do you think? You know, and so he's like, I was listening to that. I'm like, there's, there's something plain. Like I was totally clueless. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it happens. Um, we are very close to out of time. So I want to be respectful of that since I know that the people watching probably have somewhere to be at 10 o'clock. We have three minutes. If there's anything um, Ben, Ken, or Chelsea that you guys would like to say, I mean, Thank you so much for this. I hope that everybody found it interesting and can come tomorrow to see, to have their questions answered really, but. Yes, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for the panelists, Greg, everyone. And anyone that's been on this webinar, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn if you're not a coworker or otherwise have my contact list. I'm eager, ready and willing to do what I can to be part of this drive going forward. Yeah. Thank you. And same here, I'm on LinkedIn as well. And anyone interested in learning more about neurodiversity hiring initiatives, there's a lot of companies that have been very successful. And so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm happy to show people how to include more people with neurodivergence. Yeah. yeah and I'm also on LinkedIn as well. And I'm happy to speak about education and autism and neurodiversity and employment and neurodiversity as well. Yeah, wonderful. And same, same, same. Um, and all of you will be here tomorrow as well. Is that true? Great, wonderful. So we're, we're happy to answer whatever questions you guys come up with and, and uh, keep the conversation going. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you, Cynthia. Great job. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. And I guess that's it. I don't really know what happens next. <laughs> <laughs>